Me llamo Oso, or Bear. It's great to be here in Oaxaca with y'all. This is a picture of me as an eight-year-old. I was a rambunctious little one, very hyperactive, and they, they, they said I had ADHD because I like to bang on the desk and, and make music. And so my parents, who are wonderful people, they, they, they looked at the, they said, what, what, can we, what can we do? He's, you know, he's, he's all rambunctious. And they introduced me to Dr. Boris Rubinstein, who, this was in first grade, I was, uh, I was been seven years old, who was this pointy-eared psychiatrist with a big jar of M&Ms. And Boris, he, he, he gave me these little yellow pills called Ritalin. A couple years later, I went back to Boris because my eyes were all tweaking out and ticking and I couldn't stop blinking. And my parents were like, oh, you need to go stop this. So I went back to Boris and, and he switched me to, to Risperdal and Depakote. And in about a month, I became, I was an all-star athlete. I became the fattest kid in my school. I grew male breasts. <laughs> and, I, and I descended into my basement catacombs where I, I just sat in front of my computer playing Civilization II and watching the History Channel for, for years. And, and I, I just didn't feel, I didn't know who I was. I didn't know why I was there. I was in the suburbs of New York. Nothing made sense. But in that world, I, I, I found meaning. And um, finally, when I was 13 years old, my parents heard about this, this therapeutic wilderness program in the Utah desert that was based on Native American philosophy. And I went out there to the, to the middle of the desert. And um, I didn't want to go. And I was out there. And I did everything to try to kick and scream and, and go home. I even wrote a letter to my parents in pig Latin backwards saying, rape, abuse, this is no joke. <laughs> Luckily, they didn't budge, and they kept me there. About a week into the experience of temper tantruming and screaming and crying, I had kind of my last stand where I gave out this one last, ah! And I heard it bounce and off the mountain and come back. And in that moment, I woke up. I woke up into my body, realize this is what I'm here for. I am in control of my destiny. And it was an amazing experience because out there in the desert for the next two months, there was no man telling me what to do and punishing me if I didn't do it. It was natural consequences. If I didn't make a fire, I wasn't gonna eat hot food. This experience really taught me self-reliance and being in that context really helped me understand my place in the world and in the universe and in myself. So it always felt really important to share this experience that we all should have the opportunity to have this kind of personal transformation. And it's so easy to get lost in our society. So after going to college, I felt this real motivation to try to transform our world, which led me in January of 2008 to the Barack Obama campaign very early when it was still a long shot. And from that, I ended up uh, forming a political action committee, a PAC called Music for Democracy, and traveling around the United States, throwing big rock concerts for Obama, and building technology tools to get out the vote. And the first time I ever came out to San Francisco was to throw a big one of these concerts. And um, I, I discovered Silicon Valley and, and the whole scene out there, mixed in with all the art and the music. and met these venture capitalists and entrepreneurs who, who told me about this, this thing called Burning Man. And uh, lo and behold, after the election in 2008, I moved out to San Francisco. And I started my first technology company in Silicon Valley and dove into the culture head first. And then in August, I went out to Burning Man, to this desert in the middle of Nevada and found myself back there in the desert, back there, right reminded of, of, of where I found myself. Except this time, I was surrounded by 60,000 people. 60,000 people who were all being themselves, whatever that, that was, different names and different ways of dressing. And there was no money. There was no commerce. There was no garbage cans. There was no dumpsters. It was a totally different 
scene than I had ever experienced. And it was so potently packed with art and interactivity and culture. A totally different way of life. It was founded in 1986 by this underemployed landscape designer named Larry Harvey, who just decided with a couple of his friends that they were going to build this wooden man and burn it on Baker Beach in San Francisco and invite their friends. So they did that for a couple of years. And then it got so big that lo and behold, San Francisco said, you can't do this here anymore. So where did they go? They went out to the middle of the desert, to a place that Larry describes as a, a, an ocean that you can walk on. And on this site, this temporary city grew and grew every year, year after year. It's a fascinating experience because we're so accustomed to seeing the world a particular way. And in this city, Black Rock City, they drew a line in the sand. And they said, everything on this side of the sand, this line, is going to be different. And from that culture, with the, the, the laws of physics that govern it, that have emerged through that container, a whole new different kind of reality was constructed. And from that, I almost compare it to the periodic table of elements in the sense that these, these very heavy elements, even if they're created in a lab, and even if they only exist for one millisecond, this new atomic configuration is possible. Now, this event has been going on for 26 years, and it keeps growing, and it's growing all around the world. And within that context of that culture, this culture that has emerged, it's something that, that we don't even totally understand. This is, on the left, Black Rock City. And on the right is Cheyenne, Wyoming. They're both cities of around 60,000 people. And they look so fundamentally different. And it's so, sometimes when we zoom out, we can see and contextualize this world we live in. And it, there's, there's so much, I think, to learn from this and, and just understanding the sprawl of, our, of the way we choose to construct our cities, our civic infrastructure. And there's so much being a choice that we make as a society, how we design our world that we live in. Burning Man now has spread around the world. There's 50 events all around the world in places like South Africa and Lithuania. And, and, and each one of these events aren't just a one-time event. They're year-round communities that have entities that are either 501c3 nonprofits or, or even for-profit organizations that in their bylaws are tied directly back in to the potential Burning Man organization. And they're based around these principles, things like radical inclusion and gifting and decommodification. But ultimately, the most important one of all is immediacy. And this is the notion that there is no substitute for direct human experience, period. Something so easy to forget in a world where we get everything we want right away online. The analog reality. So within this organization, all sorts of new things have emerged. And we've had different organizations. And, and it's very interesting because the founders of this are actually um, making this whole thing a nonprofit now. Um, and so we're reinventing ourselves as a nonprofit. And new organizations have emerged from this. In 2005, at the event, a bunch of people who were at Burning Man, who operated heavy machinery and cranes, heard about Hurricane Katrina. And they decided to leave the event and head straight down to Mississippi and apply what they learned about building civic infrastructure to communities in need, operating all sorts of cranes and heavy machinery. And it's, it's interesting, because this is such an important moment in history. And we're chasing our tails in capitalism. The 20th century sort of debunked this idea of, of an alternative to capitalism. And so we try to find a way to cooperate without a model. So we look to nature. As you can see in this example, these starlings are actually able to, in a self-organized capacity, fend off predators by cooperating and aligning themselves together without any apparent leadership. How can we learn these lessons as humans? How do we cooperate together? And how do we create a culture that accelerates the evolution of this global cooperation? Well, the good news is it's already happening. The world has been interconnected and is illuminating this interdependence through social networks, which have changed the world. They've wired this central nervous system that connects us all in real time. And as a result of this, we're starting to see happenings emerge, like Occupy or you know, the Arab Spring. And 
this is just the beginning because once we get these networks to not only be for-profit companies and enterprises that are thrive and scale rapidly online in the cloud, but once we can build real civic institutions and social networks can become civic collaboration platforms and we can start getting our public sectors online, imagine what could be possible. So many things we can do together to change the world if we decide that we want to change our culture because the exponential evolution of technology alone will not save the world. We must reinvent the culture that governs that. We have this open canvas and this open canvas is ours to create. We can look around and we can see the walls and buried institutions that we live in or we can decide to recreate society. And now is the time and if we don't do it, it's ours to create. It's our world to change. Thank you. Shh.